fairly quiet on the farm since we uh, met before Christmas. Really, the only uh, update so far is just after the very cold, frosty spell we had, managed to get the curve and the pro line onto the oil sea grape. Other than that, it's been very quiet. Um, not been able to do anything much really in the way of hedge trimming or anything. It's just been too wet. Um, just quickly, which I think will lead on nicely to this evening's discussion, uh, just a little bit on our rainfall. So when we started the AHDB Monitor Farm programme, we uh, were lucky enough to be able to have a Davis weather station through AHDB. Uh, so for the last three years, we've been recording our rainfall. Um, our three-year average since when we got the uh, weather station is 11.78 millimetres. Um, 2022, we had 1,021 mil, so <clears throat> 150 mil behind our three-year average. So far this year in January, we've had 91.8 mil, of which most of that has come in the last five to seven days uh, in the last rainstorm. And that's, that's about me for my update. Um, so hopefully leading on this evening, um, you can see why we have a big issue with Septor here in Cornwall. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Yes, no, per perfect introduction. So, yes, so the, the, the idea of tonight was, um, evening, Mike, I can see there now, glad you made it. Um, the idea was to really, you know, Septoria is obviously prevalent across the southwest uh, as much as anywhere in the country. And we just wanted to really sort of just to pull together brains and, and, and experience knowledge and, and catch up with everybody's strategies and future thinking, current research and so on and so forth. Delighted we've got uh, two two speakers to start us off tonight to sort of lay the foundations. Uh, Catherine Harries uh, is, is my colleague in HDB. She heads up our crop, crop protection department. Um, and actually, she's moved down to the southwest. She's seen she's seen the light um, and, and, and live, living in Devon, not so far away. So that's nice to have you down here, Catherine. Uh, and she'll she'll start us off with the presentation. And then if there's questions, we'll we'll. So immediate questions, we'll take those, but then we'll move on to, to Stephen uh, Kilday from, from Chagas in, in Ireland. Delighted Stephen's been able to join us. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Stephen uh, when I went over in, uh, when did we go over? November, we had a, a small group of us went over and clearly they're doing a lot of work over there and under Stephen's stewardship. And I thought it'd be really useful to to get uh, their perspective and, and, and find out similarities, differences and, and forward thinking from, from Stephen and Chuggas. So with that basis, we'll we'll kick on and uh, hand, Catherine, I'll hand over to you and hopefully perhaps more proficiently than me, you will share your screen and present and, and we'll we'll go from there. OK, thank you, Philip. Um, can you see my slide? My slides yeah. OK? Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, as Philip said, uh, my name is Catherine Harries. I'm a senior crop protection scientist in the IPM team. Um, and my main responsibilities are the recommended list disease ratings and fungicide performance. Um, so today I'm just going to take you through um, a few sort of bits of work to do with Septoria that we have. Um, first thing is to just talk about how to assess septoria, which is a really useful thing, really useful, useful skill to be able to have if you're doing on-farm trials or even if you're not, just generally. Um, how to, sort of why we use variety mixtures. I know that's it's an increasing um, thing that people are taking up these days. Why we do them, how we can do them, and then an introduction to our variety blend tool, which HDB developed last year or year before. Um, and then just a quick run through of the latest fungicide performance curves for Septoria, which were released at the Agronomist Conference in um, December. So um, this is why we're all here today, um, Septoria. I'm sure you all know what it looks like, um, but it's really important when you're looking at Septoria that you, you only define it as Septoria if you can see these black pycnidia. Um, if you can't see them, you can't be sure that the damage or the necrosis is due to septoria. Um, so always have a look for them when you're assessing septoria, because um, 
I don't know if any of you recognise what this is. Um, it's actually a very late stage of yellow rust. Um, these black dots are yellow rust teliospores. Um, and we're seeing this more and more in this country with climate change. Um, it's, the, it's one of the later stages in the yellow rust life cycle. And we see it further in the east, um, perhaps don't see it so much down here, but um, it's important to be aware of it so you don't sort of think that might be septoria. You can also get um, necrosis um, from yellow rust. Um, and if you if you come to this field, you, you maybe haven't walked it for a few few weeks, you could be forgiven for at a first glance thinking that's um, terrible septoria. But actually, we can't see any pycnidia. And what it is, is just old dyed off yellow rust. I mean, hopefully you wouldn't get to that stage. But just to be aware that, you know, you really do need to have seen those pycnidia to be able to define it as septoria. Um, and then sometimes we can get a mix of diseases on leaves. So here we can see, um, are you able to see my mouse cursor, Philip? Just, um, before I, oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> it, it's, it's not the biggest or most colourful pointer, um, Catherine, so you might yeah. have to give a bit of verbal description where you are as well. That's fine. <laughs> um, hopefully down here you can see the septoria lesion with the pe pycnidia. Um, up the top, you've got some stripes of yellow rust, um, and then you've also got some um, small brown rust pustules. Um, on this leaf on the right, you can see side by side the septoria pycnidia and the yellow rust telia spores. And you can see the yellow rust telia are actually a lot larger than the pycnidia, so it's easy to tell when you see them side by side. So the reason it's important to know this is if you're trying out any new measures or um, say you're you're trying maybe different drilling dates or a new fungicide, it's really important to leave um, not just an area with, with your normal treatment, but an untreated area. So you can assess how how well your treatment has done compared to no treatment. Um, and we need to we need to quantify the disease levels in in those areas so you're able to you know know have some evidence of, of whether your treatment has worked or not um so it's a really good skill to be able to just part the crop and be able to do a disease assessment um so we have uh, i'll go through through it in a minute but we have um a youtube video which was designed for the recommended list trial operators but it just sort of takes you through how to do a disease assessment so do go and have a look at that if you're interested um, and ADAS have produced a really good guide to on-farm trials as well, which can help you um, work out how to design the trial and things you need to think about. Um, so we're just going to have a little go at doing a disease assessment, um, just so you can get your eye in. So what, obviously I've just got pictures of the crop, so it's not ideal, but hopefully you'll get the idea. Um, so what you want to do is look at the top four leaf layers. Um, but ignore any any leaves that um, are naturally senesced um, and then just record the percent infection. So this is the assessment key that the recommended list trial operators use. Um, so it goes from 0 to 100, um, very rarely reach the realms of 50 to 100, so it's mainly the lower levels that we use. Um, I was going to put this in the chat but I'm not sure how easy that is but um, you'll be able to see it alongside the the, um, the, the photo I'll show you in a minute. Um, so here's a picture of a crop um, and I've parted it and you can see down to the bottom um, you can see some of the lower leaf layers are senesced um, but if we just take sort of some individual leaves to start with to get our eye in um, that one is no disease, 0%, there's no disease on that one. Um, this one is 7%, I'll just read out what 7% is. Um, so 5% is small lesions beginning to form areas of dead tissue across the width of the leaf. And then 10% is two lower leaves, large area of disease tissue, some covering a third of the leaf. So that's sort of in between, so 7%. Um, and I would say this is probably about 10% overall looking into that crop. But obviously you part the crop in a few different places um, and get take an average. 
um, do another one. It's slightly higher disease levels. Um, that particular leaf, I'd say, is probably about 30%. So 25% um, is leaves appear half infected, half green. So it's a bit more than that. Um, so yeah, 30%. Um, that one, 60%, um, which is, so 50% means leaves appear more infected than green. And you can see most of that leaf is infected. Um, it's quite easy to overestimate the levels at this, at um, the higher levels. So counterintuitively, 25% is half infected, half green. That will feel like that ought to be 50%, but it's not. So that's why we don't really get such high, high levels above, above 50% normally. But then overall, if you take all the leaf layers, including the flag leaf, um, into account, it's probably only about 17 to 20% that, that whole um, crop. So um, I've got the assessment key on the side now. If you just have a look at that crop and see what you think it is, um, I'll give you a few moments to read the assessment key and have a think. Feel free to put, put it in the chat if you you know, I'm not sure I can see the chat actually, so that might not help. So if we look, it's, you know, it's quite quite infected. So if we start at 10%, two lower leaves, large areas of diseased tissue, some co covering a third of the leaf, I'd say it's probably a bit more than that. Um, if we then go up to 25%, leaves appear half infected, half green. Um, on average, I'd say it, that probably is what it was. So I've put this one as 25%. I've got another example. Obviously, this looks like a much cleaner crop. So um, start from the beginning. There's definitely a, a, a bit of infection. Um, so let's look at 0.1, um, which is one lesion per tiller. I'd say there's probably a bit more than that, perhaps um, two small lesions per tiller. So I'm going to say 1% for that one. And it's just important to stay consistent within yourself. Don't worry if you've got it wildly out, but as long as you're consistent between your assessments, that's the most important thing. So, yeah, I hope everyone's found that useful. Um, I'm going to move on to talking about variety blends now. So why do we want to do variety blends? Um, so they increase the gen genetic diversity within a field, and this can help to slow or reduce the spread of some diseases. And this in turn can help reduce the risk of varietal resistance breakdown. And how do we do them? So it's best to mix varieties with different disease resistance profiles. And a mixture of three or, three or more varieties is best. Um, and you don't need to mix these thoroughly, just a crude mixture is fine. Um, but it's really important to know your end market. So um, both wheat and barley mixtures for feed and wheat for distilling are generally acceptable, um, but molksters don't currently accept mixtures. So yeah, just know your market before you, you start growing it. And then as with everything new that you try, um, test it on farm before you adopt it more widely. And again, you can use that ADAS guide to on farm trials. So AHDB have created a tool to um, help you with selecting a good mix that has a good diversity and has varieties um, with different sort of characteristics and different disease resistant profiles. Um, and it uses the recommended list data. So I know it looks pretty complex, um, but if you can just invest a bit of time to understand how it works, um, it's just, yeah, it's a really useful tool to be able to use. Um, so I'll just explain now. Um, it's based on two metrics. The first is a measure of how good the varieties are. So that is basically untreated, um, our recommended list data, um, apart from um, fungicide, treated yield. So it's things like disease resistance, lodging, um, specific weight. Um, so that's the first metric. And the second metric is the parental diversity score, which is basically just saying 
how different are the parents of the different varieties um, because you don't want varieties that have the same parentage because it's possible they'll have the same genes and if for example um, they have the same um, yellow rust resistance gene they might be susceptible to breakdown of from a new race um, and a higher parental diversity score is better so then this is what the second page of the tool looks like again it looks quite complex but um, you can select different things you're interested in so um, for example here I've said that I, my blend must contain Graham um, I want to have at least one variety that's got orange root blossom midge resistance um, and then what I'm looking for is varieties that are in the top right hand sorry mixtures that are in the top right hand corner of the chart because this is where um, so along the side we have parental diversity score and we want a high score and down here we have um, just the score which shows how good the variety is so we want good varieties that have that are different to each other and that um, have different parents so I've just selected a, a random dot in this corner and I can see that my mixture is Graham, Theodore and Champion but there's plenty of other options there um, so yeah please just go on there have a play around and see if you find it useful okay I'll move on to um, just a quick rundown of the 2022 fungicide performance data for Septoria um, and this was all presented at the HGB Agronomist Conference. There's a recording online if you want the, the whole, all of the slides and the whole presentation. And an extended presentation with all of the graphs in um, is uploaded to the website. So just a bit of background um, information. Um, so when you're choosing fungicides, obviously match fungicides to the primary disease risk um, and variety based on variety, sowing date, location and local weather, amongst other things. Um, and yeah, resistance poses a significant threat to the performance of fungicides. So um, it's essential to take resistance management into account when planning fungicide programmes. So that's things like mi using mixtures and alternations of fungicides with different modes of action and from different fungicide groups. Um, these are often the most effective and reduce the likelihood that fungicide resistance will develop. Um, and for more information, visit um, the Fungicide Resistant Action Group's webpage, which, sit, which sits on AHGB's webpage. So in the fungicide performance trials, um, a single application of each product is applied to each plot at four different doses. Um, so quarter dose, half dose, full dose and double dose. Um, obviously, it's not allowed to apply the double dose in the field, but we use it to help fit the curves. Um, which I'll, I'll show I'll show today with the double dose included, but the slides online are only up to 100 percent dose. Um, and we split the activity in the we split the fungicide activity into protectant and eradicant. Um, so we use the eradicant activity is based on data from leaves that emerged prior to the spray application. Um, and the protecting activity is from um, the target leaf and those that emerged afterwards. Um, and these were the products that were included um, in our trials in 2022. Um, so Arizona or full pet was included at just full full dose um, because it's a really useful benchmark. Obviously, it's a multi site, so the resistance um, doesn't change too much. Um, and it helps us to classify the resistant and eradicant um, activity. Um, then we have Proline, Marisa, which is straight methentrifluconazole, Peptiga, which is straight fempicoximid, um, and then the mixtures, including their mixture partners, fluxopyroxide and prothioconazole. Um, and it's interesting to note, we did actually have a further five products in our trials this year, um, not five actives, five products, um, but these are unregistered and we'll release the data once they're registered. Um, and we include these, these two straight products um, to help us see the contribution that the mixture partner gives. But remember, um, it's not you, you shouldn't apply them on their own. They should all, always be applied in mixture with at least one fungicide with an alternative mode of action that has efficacy against the target disease.
Catherine, I'm just going to butt in and ask you something yeah. on that last slide. You mentioned those five products, uh, and I know you probably can't say very much, but A, what are the timescales when the information will be released? And B, should we be excited? <laughs> um, I don't think I can comment on either of them. I don't want to do the wrong thing. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Of course, you should be excited. Always, always should be excited. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have a minimum level of efficacy that, you know, they have to have in order to be included in the trials. So, yeah, hopefully that answers a bit. Um, we had seven um, sites that targeted Septoria in 2022 um, across the UK and in Ireland. They all provided pr protectant activity and two of them provide, provided curative, curative activity or eradicant. Sorry, we use curative and eradicant interchangeably um, which isn't helpful so um, I don't know if you're familiar with these charts um, but they can, they, they can take a while to get your head around but basically along the side we have um, the disease level so percent septoria um, and along the bottom we have the dose rate so percentage of full label rate um, the, the shape here is the septoria level in the untreated plot so that's with no applications applied and then for each product we have um, these colored shapes and the line so there's a key here this shows us the orange is Revistar and um, the shapes are the level of disease in that plot at that dose level um, and then the dose response curves are fitted based on that and you can see they're sort of this typical shape where they they drop down steeply and then level off. Um, and this helps us to see which products are performing, yeah, how the products perform compared to each other. We also have two benchmarks. So normally we just include Arizona or Folpet at the full label dose. Um, but this year we also included Proline um, because we like to include a plot so we can um, take samples of resistance management. So that's quite interesting to see. Um, there's two graphs because it, it's um, we just split it out so it's easier to see on two charts because this on the left hand side this chart is the mixture products and on the right hand side are the, the solo products. Um, so what we can see from this chart um, is that Proline gave about 30% control compared to the untreated with Arizona giving about 45% control. Um, and remember, this is just from a single spray application in the season, and it um, and this is just from 2022 using seven trials worth of data. Um, but it was good control from for, from all products, um, both straights and mixtures. If we then move on to the eradicant data, um, we can see the sim the sim. Um, we no longer include Arizona in this chart because Arizona doesn't provide any eradicant activity. Um, so we don't bother putting it in. Um, yeah, we can see similar control from Proline as in the protecting situation um, and methentrifluconazole in Myriza and fempicoximid in Pectiga um, are giving sim similar control at full, low, full dose. Um, but Myriza is slightly better than Pectiga at the lower rates. And in this situation, um, Univoc was slightly better than Revistar. This is now the chart showing the yield responses. Um, so we have yield on the side and um, at the at zero dose is the yield of the untreated plots and then sort of the opposite, um, how the yield increases as the doses increase. And then the yield of the um, plots that just had full label dose of Arizona and Proline. And we can see that the disease control followed through for yield um, with a 0.2 tons per hectare yield response from a single application of Proline in Arizona compared to the untreated um, and Peptiga giving roughly a half a ton higher yield compared to Myriza on this chart here. Um, we then analyse all the data from the last three years. So this is from 2020 to 2022 and it's now 17 trials worth of data that go into the protectant curves. 
Um, and we can see that Proline is now included with the four doses and Imtrex is included because they were trialled in 2020 and 2021. Um, Pectiga dro drops out because it was only trialled in 2022, so it's not fair to include it when it's just been trialled in one year. Um, we can see that Arizona with a sim single application at full rate gives 50% control. Um, and on the singles chart on the right, Proline and Imtrex are still giving useful levels of control in this protected situation, but the newer, newer active methantrifluconazole is clearly giving better control. And with the mixtures, Univoc and Revistar are sitting quite close together. We then move on to the eradicant data from 2020 to 2022. Um, this is based on 10 trials. We can see um, the trends are broadly the same. Um, the curves are just a bit shallower, showing this benefit to increasing dose rates in eradicant situations. And these trends um, followed through to yield. So if we look on the right hand side at the single products, um, Arizona, Proline and Imtrex at full label dose are quite similar. Um, but here, Myriza gives um, about half a ton yield benefit over Prothalconazole. And with the mixtures, um, this shows the benefit of the mixture partners. Um, so the flux pyroxide and the prothioconazole. Um, and the full dose of Unifoc is giving a ton per hectare yield increase over the untreated. Um, so we also plot these charts, which shows how field efficacy has changed. So this is for azoles. We've got prothioconazole with the grey triangles and methantrifluconazole with the orange squares. Um, and up the side, we have percent control of septoria triticy, and along the bottom is the years. And we can see in 20, in 2001, um, Proline was giving about sort of 80 to 90 percent control. Um, but in the last couple of years, it's declined to sort of 20 to 30 percent um, with seasonal vi variability along the way. And in the last couple of years, methantrifluconazole um, is giving similar to control as Proline did in about 2008. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this plots out going forwards. Um, and our resistance monitoring has showed that the a that azole isolates with re reduced sensitivity are accounting for an increased proportion of the population. Um, so that could account for this decline. We can then look at um, similar charts for the mixtures. So this is including Revistar, Ascra X Pro and Univoc from 2017 um, to 2022, although Ascra drops out from 2021. Um, and you can see in 2021 and 2022, um, Revistar and Univoc has slightly lower control. Um, so this could be either like season, seasonal factors or it could be a, redu a reduction in activity of the mixture partners, um, prothioconazole and, and flux pyroxide. But what's quite interesting is to look at the relative ranking of the products. So if, in 2017 to 2019, um, you can see the green line of Revistar is giving more control than Univoc. Um, but in the last few seasons, this is switched round and Univoc is giving slightly higher levels of control than Revistar. So that was a um, rundown of fungi performance um, and just yeah, some concluding remarks, really. Um, Test, test, test. So embrace on-farm trials, um, use that guide that ADAS have produced um, and always make sure you leave an untreated area and assess both your treatment and your untreated area and record it so you know for subsequent seasons what's happened. Um, introducing any diversity into your field is good. So using variety blends, for example, and it's good time invested in understanding the HDB tools so you can use them to full effect. And then correct fungicide choice is obviously always important for the situation and also bearing in mind um, resistance management. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Um, I, I guess is the best way to try and do this is by raising your hand if you've got any immediate questions. Has anybody got anything they want to ask while it's fresh in the mind on what Catherine just presented? 
just while you're thinking about that, as I was going to ask a question, has anybody out there tried tried the blends in the last harvest? And what what were your experiences? I know one or two were in the region who had a go. Maybe not on this call. Okay, we'll take uh, we'll take no no waving hands as, as satisfied audience. Catherine, oh Mike. Yeah, can I can I just ask um, you, Catherine, the the data that's provided there on the response curves. Am I right in thinking that is just from one application? So, yeah. so the quest the, the question to us as growers is how we take the data that we've got there from one application and then put that together in in a program that we're going to use throughout a season and the factors that we should consider in developing a, a program rather than looking at just one individual application so i'd just be interested on your comments on that please yeah so the the fungicide performance trials aren't designed to sort of help help you design a program they're just to see the activity of individual products against other products um we do have some pages on the HTB website explaining what you need to consider when you're putting together a fungicide program at all the different tea timings. And it, that incorporates the resistance management guidance that comes out of FRAG, the Fungicide Resistance Action Group. And that's updated every year with any new advice or any new products. Um, so I think if you Google fungicide programs AHDB, it should come up. And we've got it for winter wheat winter barley, oats, rye, triticale, I think. Thanks, Catherine. I see uh, Andrew's put a note in uh, at Ilminster there. Um, you're going to have a go with two variety blend this this summer. So uh, we'll watch we'll watch that space, uh, Andrew. OK. We'll um, we'll move on and uh, and then sort of come to the more general discussion at the end, uh, if you wish. Uh, we'll 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 switch over over the seas now to uh, Stephen in in Ireland, Dublin. Uh, welcome welcome Stephen. Good to, good of you to join us. No problem. Um, I suspect it's probably just been as wet as it, in there as it has been with us over here. So you've got similar problems. Yeah, pretty um, much. Um, we'll we'll I'll let you take over control, um, Stephen, and we'll we'll pick up. Again, if anybody's got any burning questions, raise your hands and we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll butt in because Stephen won't be able to see raised hands when he's presenting. But um, uh, I'll, we'll otherwise save save them all for the end. Yeah. Okay. So, oh. can, I, can I confirm, Philip, you're seeing the, the full screen there? Yeah, yeah, that's good. The battle Perfect. for control is it. Sorry, yeah. Perfect. I suppose before we get started now, I have I've a seven-year-old that has over the last uh, three years developed a a keen ability to know when I'm starting to talk and starting to present on Zoom meetings or team meetings. So if if my uh, my screen goes blank and I, I go quiet, uh, don't worry about me. I'm not laying on the floor. I'm out bribing her with the iPad to be quiet or something like that. So um, yeah, look, thanks a million for for giving me the invite uh, to join you the, this evening. Look, I, I, I suppose I, what I'll do is I'll give a very much a quick um, overview hopefully it should should be no more than maybe uh, 25 minutes or maybe a half an hour um but as philip says look if you have any questions at all please shout up i've a tendency to run through slides thinking everybody knows what i'm talking about uh when you're standing in person you can see the blank faces completely so um in in teams you won't see the blank faces but do do shout up um if you, if if there's anything you want a uh, clarification on or look if I'm going too fast or if, the, if, I, if, if I've completely lost you. Look, to start off, look, I'll give an outline to give you an idea uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, and I suppose the picture on the left is to give you an idea, look, of, look uh, like yourselves, Septoria is our, is our biggest issue, I suppose, in wheat. Um, that's a crop of sake actually in North County Dublin, so probably one of the drier regions in Ireland. Um, and I think this photograph's taken the 18th of June. You look close enough, you'll actually see the the anthers on on the on the ears and it had a decent fungicide program so i like there was a, there was quite a bit of money spent on this now it was one of the old, like there was a number of the i suppose cooker varieties around north county dublin and mead this year which would be north of dublin and i think when 
when word word got out that there was a crop looking bad, I think there was a lot of agronomists um, driving pretty much the roads, every road of North Dublin, and um, trying to find any crops that might have a uh, cougar in the background to see were they looking like this. Thankfully, there weren't. There was a few, but there was there were few and far between. Um, so it is a problem that we have. And look, we in Chagas, I suppose, covering it from the crop science department, um, and specifically myself working in pathology, it is one of the ones that we tackle most. And in wheat it is, we move across into barley, it's things like ramularia that have become our biggest issue in terms of a pathology or disease perspective. But So look, to start off with, I'll give you an idea of who we are, what we do. Um, why has Septoria an issue over here? Look, it's the same issue as yourselves, it's wet. Um, solutions or potential solutions or maybe uh, pitfalls to those solutions. How we build control programs, look, getting, I suppose, maybe our, our, our feel or our sort of view on how to build a program. I think I have one or two slides maybe in that. And then maybe some of the research that we're doing or where we're thinking going forward in terms of what we need to be doing to, to help our, our, our farmers. So who, who exactly are we? Um, just put the, the pointer here. So basically within Chagask um, itself, Chagask is, a, is the Irish word for it to inform or to teach. The organisation covers, and you may, be, you may be aware of it, but we cover pretty much all of the agriculture and food development. We are the, the, the National Agriculture and Food Development Authority for, for Ireland. Um, and within that, look, we cover everything from dairy, um, which would, you can imagine, takes a lot of the resources of the organisation through to crops, which uh, unfortunately we, we would argue that we don't get enough resources, of course. Um, we are, we're sort of embedded within the, the Crops, Environment and Land Use Programme, um, who, who's run by John Spinks, some of you may have known from his time over with ADAS. He, he's now heads up that programme. It covers the crops, as I say, and a major aspect now is, is the environment and the land use. Within the crops then, we're a team of about 13 researchers with the equivalent, I suppose, technicians and, and field staff. Um, but we cover everything, everything to do with crops, uh, from break crops, through to pathology, uh, weeds, etc. But we've also then got uh, molecular sort of our biotechnology crop improvement that would be involved in potato breeding, grass breeding, and genetics and stuff like that. So there is a, it's a, it's a relatively small team to try and cover the whole lot. Um, myself, I cover pathology, uh, cereals and potatoes, so it's it's all aspects of cereals. Give an idea then of what we're doing, why we do it. Look, we like to think that we were able to produce some good yields over here um, across the board in terms of the cereals. We're directed to a certain extent by policy coming from the government. And look, climate action is a big thing there, of course. And um, from a disease control perspective, that's going to be about input sustainability and um, reducing our, our pesticide input. Um, within the EU, of course, the, the Green Deal with the ambition, uh, our, our ambitious plans to reduce our total pesticide usage by 50% and the role of IPM, et cetera. So that has a huge sort of input in terms of what we do. But then, of course, look, from a, a pest sort of perspective, look, it's about those major pests that are pretty much exactly the same as yourselves. Like black grass has become a big issue over here. Brome is, I suppose, a continued issue. Septoria. And then in the background of each one of those would be things like resistance uh, and aspects like that. So it is that really sort of directs where we we direct our research um, in terms of trying to provide advice uh, for the knowledge transfer side of the wing. So as I, I did mention in the previous slide, we work very closely with our, our knowledge transfer colleagues. We've got three specialists, one that covers soils and then two specific specialists that I would work very closely with that would cover the side of the country and the northeast of the country and um, in the major crop growing areas. And they, the specialists themselves then will work with the advisors that, that would be on, on I suppose, farm. Um, of course, look, the advisors will be, they will get some level of crop walking, but of course, there's a lot of a lot of paperwork now that they're involved in. So, um, it, but it is a way for me in terms of the, the researcher, it's an important sort of uh, communication stream because we do the research. We're able to get that research to the KT specialists who are dedicated to actually give that information or digest that information and give it to the advisors and farmers. But likewise, I like to think that actually I would be sitting in Oak Park in the research centre. I need to know what's actually happening on farm. And that's where the network actually feeds back upwards. So it's not a one way stream. Uh, and the example would be that very first picture of that crop of sake. 
I would have been in that very, very quickly after the agronomist would have seen it, the farmer would have told the agronomist and the agronomist immediately would have phoned me and I would have been in the car up to get samples and to see what it. So it is very much a two way sort of stream of information and it's a very useful sort of stream that we we, we are very fortunate to have in, in the organisation. Just a quick overview of crop production in Ireland. I'm sure you are, are familiar with it, but basically we grow crops in the drier part and the better soils, which are the south and southeast of the country. Um, in terms of rainfall, I was interested to hear uh, actually sort of in terms of 1100 or 1200 mils of rain. We're talking pretty much about a similar rainfall from about probably about here across uh, is probably about that about that thousand uh, mils of rain. Where we're based specifically, we're based in Carlo, which is is here. It's a little bit drier, 850, probably one of the drier places. Uh, you might argue maybe not the best place to be doing disease research, but we consistently get uh, fairly decent levels of disease to do the trials on. But I should say when we do our trials, we will tend to do some field trials up in uh, North County Dublin, maybe Mead, which would be, a, as you can see from the map, in a fairly intense area of production. Um, we do it in Carlo, of course, and then we do some down in the wetter region, down in Cork, which would be consistently wetter. It also probably is a little bit milder over the winter months, so we probably get a, a, a I suppose, a bit more, bit more receptoria, probably more akin to yourselves, being honest, in terms of that. So that's that's where we grow them, and I suppose it gives an idea of why we have our problems uh, and our diseases. Wet weather diseases tend to be the important ones. Look, this, this evening we're talking about septoria, um, but I can't ignore the other wet weather diseases because they take up uh, probably as much time, especially. This guy here, which uh, since the loss of CTL is becoming one that eats into a bit more of my time, especially seeing that we we don't have a huge amount of information on actually what we can do in it other than try and spray, being honest, uh, and that is Rambularia. So um, there are the problems that we deal with. How do we go about sort of from a research side of things? How What do we do to try and overcome that? The first thing I'd say is that we don't do it in isolation. Uh, we have to work with others to do this. Um, especially when we're relatively small in terms of the team that we have, we need to we need to look and sort of collaborate to get the best out of it. And I think the example would be, as Catherine presented the the curves. We we I suppose are involved in in the curves. Uh, we will I suppose we maybe twenty years, maybe more at this stage of involvement. Um, and that's that's work that we are happily we happily fund that our, ourselves and provide the data. We follow the exact same protocol. Sit in in the meetings with Catherine about it. Um, it provides us with good information. But again, we don't necessarily have all the information on rust, so we will be looking at the curves for rust, yellow rust information, and that then is important to us to see that. But equally, we know there's population changes. Uh, we like to see what might be happening over with you guys, just like I suppose you are happy to see the data that comes from us. So we don't do it in isolation. But we also then are, are involved in a number of different things. So. We'll be looking to develop techniques to, I suppose, detect uh, whether that is the pathogen itself or changes in the pathogen, changes in the population. And um, we then apply these into uh, monitoring, seeing what look, what's actually happening out there. Um, if we find something, then we need to test the strategies. Look, we need to sort of in, sort of tease out what can we do, and then from all that information, look, we need to make recommendations to give it to our, our, our specialists and give it to the advisors, etc. So it is a sort of a process that we are involved in. And I suppose it isn't it doesn't just follow this direct sort of system across from from left to right. There will be cases where actually look, things changes. Uh, the aspect might be the, the whole discussion about uh, variable mixtures or blends. We're actually that's something that we would take maybe from some recommendations that are being made. We will then put it back into the strategies. We might actually monitor what's happening and go to the opposite way, etc. So it is a fairly fluid sort of system, but it is we, we need to be with a, a pathogen such as septoria that is continually evolving, rapidly evolving. Um, we need to be fairly flexible in what we are doing and how we approach the, I suppose, the whole research of control sort of strategies, because it can change very quickly and, and throw what we what we know on our on our heads very quickly. So, and with that, basically, uh, I have one slide on what is it what that we're dealing with. The pathogen itself is actually from a, an academic sort of point of view. It's called Zemoseptoria triticae. It was it was it got a change in its name back in the, I think, 2011, 2012. Before that, it was called Microsphorella graminicola, which would have been a name change back in the late 70s when they found the sexual stage. And before that, it was Septoria criticae. And um, so we know it as Septoria, and that's all, that's how I'd be referring to it as, but it is, 
it is a, a pathogen, Zemoceptoria. It is it is highly uh, adaptable. It's evolved for the wet conditions, so it has the ability. The as you know, I think Catherine Adent or mentioned the the black pycnidia. They will be full of spores that are pretty much evolved to move in the water as soon as rain splashes. They'll just happily move. They're not swimming. They're basically moving in the flow of the water in the splash of the water. So you can see one of those may, might contain a, a thousand, couple of thousand spores. Raindrop splashing on that. It only takes one spore to actually cause a lesion. So it can build up fairly rapidly once it gets going. Um, and it has an awful lot of sex. So basically, once it does get going, has sex, it will move and it'll move genes about very, very quickly. So highly adaptable. The host itself, look, wheat. Um, and being honest, look, we grow mostly susceptible varieties over here. Um, I'll get into that now in a minute. Why we do that is uh, probably similar sort of maybe to yourselves to a certain extent. And the environment, look, is damp and mild. Uh, we have winter cropping. So there's a long period where where this this disease or pathogen can survive and I suppose thrive. Um, so it, it isn't a case where it's a very short window. It's It's got a, a latent period. And that means from the point of infection through to the point of producing new spores. It's relatively long for a, a disease uh, such as a wheat or a cereal disease. It takes maybe about three weeks under, I suppose, normal conditions. Glasshouse under absolute ideal conditions, so you can get it done in two weeks. Over the winter, it's probably going to be a lot longer. So ability to give it winter cropping, it allows us to build up this inoculum to get to a point that epidemic proportions will be reached when we don't want them to be reached. And that's uh, during grain filling if we don't do something about it. So what do we do about it? And look, the integrated pest management is the is the key or buzzword. What is it? Simply, it is integrating all the different measures of control that we possibly can. Simplify it here, the chemical variety, cultural. Look, we can break that down into a number of different things. But I think reality, we probably have, uh, and we put a big, huge emphasis of our time probably into chemical uh, and strategies of chemical, maybe not so much into the variety of cultural uh, that we should be doing. But I suppose that is maybe reflective of the systems that we we, we use and, and are using to produce wheat. So um, I think with that, we need to tease out, I suppose, the different positives or negatives or solutions, I should, like as I said, the potential solutions and maybe the pitfalls that are in each of those solutions. The chemicals straight away at the start with, um, what is it? What is it? Look, we know we know it is a solution. Catherine presented some very interesting or good data there and the curves that clearly demonstrate new actives do work. Um, but of course, look, there is issues with regulation, registration and availability. As I mentioned, maybe not maybe not as important with you guys now after Brexit, but within the EU, the Green Deal means that we're going to have to reduce our pesticide usage by 50 percent. And that's going to come at cost. Um, where are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? But it's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. Um, we could spend the next two hours, three hours doing it and we won't have any answer. We won't have got any further. That's that's the, the regulation. Registration then is getting extremely tough. There was a change back in 2011 and how things are registered. And that basically increased the bar that things have to get over uh, quite a lot. It hasn't stopped chemicals, as you can see, Univoc or, or Initrec, Fentagoxamide and Mitfentrafluconazole clearly got over that. The other SDHIs that came onto the market got over that hurdle. So it is possible to get over it. But from a, a manufacturer's point of view, it is a lot more difficult to actually get that molecule to get over that hurdle. Uh, and then, of course, look, the other thing is going to be the availability, which look, CTL, it regulation, the registration sort of put a stop to that. And I put up the graph here to demonstrate from our own trials going back by 20 years, the value that was in CTL. Um, and this is these are trials that basically all all trials that we have direct comparisons where we have a, a product, mostly in this scenario here, it's like Azol or Azol SDHI. With and without chlorothalonil at one or two litres. Generally, it's one litre, I think, in, in this sort of scenario. And again, it is it's one application, potentially two applications, three applications. It's all put in. We have the similar for for a programs type, but when we put everything in, we can see that the 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 red and light green, which basically means our the fungicide and the fungicide with chlorothalonil, pretty much overlapped for most of that time. Basically, we were we were recommending and farmers were applying chlorothalonil as an anti-resistance sort of strategy so that we would delay or 
try to delay the emergence of resistance to the other, I suppose, the single molecule that might have been in the mix, be that your epoxic nasal, your prothio, bosculate for a long time, and then we went into the SDHIs, the newer SDHIs. But as you can see then, as we went from about maybe 2014 onwards, there was a, a separation of those um, out. And, and in this sort of range here, we're really talking about the Azoles SDHIs. So not just from an anti-resistance perspective, but from a disease control and a yield perspective, chlorothalonil was actually adding quite a lot. Um, in this sort of case, it's about 0.6 of a ton. But again, as I say, that's everything lumped in. When we were actually into a fungicide program, it was closer to a, a ton. So chlorothalonil was providing quite a big bit of I suppose, disease control and yield benefit. Clearly, fungicides themselves, I should say, are, are providing, uh, undoubtedly providing a, a yield benefit and, and disease control. Um, so it does, it does, it did pose us with a, a major concern back in 2020. Uh, and it's something that I'll highlight in a, in a few minutes. What we're doing to look at as look, Fulbit, being honest, you don't have to jump jump ahead. Fulbit is, the, is how we were are replacing it. And unfortunately, has looked well. But then the other aspect, and it ties in with the loss of chlorothalonil and that, that separation of that graph is going to be that resistance development. And I just show up a, a picture or a figure here from sort of a map of Europe where we, in 2019, with colleagues throughout Europe, we, we looked at some of the key mutations that are involved in SDHI and azole resistance. And you can see, look, as you go east, you get a higher, it turns orange, it turns yellow, it turns red. So where we have the high pressure, where we're applying these fungicides, I suppose, in higher doses, it's inevitable that we would select resistance. It's 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 the basis of evolution, being honest. So it's inevitable that that would happen. Um, but that does have consequences. And just going back to that previous graph, you can see what those consequences are. We, we start to lose our efficacy and, and the separation between the chlorothalonil and just the fungicide itself sort of uh, separates out. Um, has this got any worse? Yeah, look, we've we've crept even higher with that mutation S five two four T. Crept higher with with the mutations here. Uh, so cumulatively, we're almost fixed in the population of SDHA sort of moderate resistance. We have the other mutation that is known to cause high levels of resistance, and unfortunately, that hasn't uh, taken a a real foothold in the population. However, as Catherine sort of highlighted in terms of the curves. We know that what we have in terms of be it the azole or the, and the, the sensitivity mutations for that and the mutations that we have for SDHIs, that actually efficacy is impacted and impacted significantly. Um, so much so that look, you can clearly see the difference between the older chemistry and that newer chemistry. Um, so look, chemicals uh, in terms of our, our management strategy, yes, they do work, but we do need to protect them. We need to use them wisely. And clearly you can see that as we rely very heavily on them, we are pushing a population to overcome that. That's that's an uh, inevitability, unfortunately. So we do need to start to look at the other components. And and this is some of the work, again, that highlights the, the collaborative sort of nature that we need to be in, where I, I know Chloe Morgan from ADAS uh, would have been, would have put this report and was funded by AHDB, uh, funded by the Irish Department of Agriculture and BSF were involved in it looking at the role of the sowing date. Um, and, and this is sort of the outcome where you move your sowing date earlier, you reduce your resistance rate and you push it that bit later, you increase your resistance rate. And so it is a case on, look, can we, can we, how late can we sow is basically the, the answer to that without having a massive impact on yield and penalty or yield penalty. We know that the later we go, look, it's inevitably going to start hitting yield. Is there a point there where actually there's a, a balance between, I suppose, the risk from disease um, and the risk of yield loss? And that's that's the question. But the other thing is that we also know that given the wrong year, given the right year, whatever way we want to look at it, um, the septoria will also be releasing its spores pretty much well into, into winter. Um, so even though we push maybe very late, it still doesn't mean that we won't reach epidemic proportions or uh, proportions of, of the disease the following uh, late spring that would cause, but would, I suppose, cause significant yield loss if we didn't sort of put a, 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 um, an approach in place to control it. Um, now, this is going to be a case on from a, a pathologist's point of view and, and myself and sort of saying, look, yeah, we know that. Look, if we can push our sowing really late into December, there's going to be less ascospores which are the windborne spores. So as I say, septoria can produce two types of spores. One that are ascospores, they're sexually produced, they're blowing the wind, 
And then you have the pycnidia spores that are producing those black uh, sort of visible pycnidia that you would see later on in the year. And um, they're rain splashed. So these guys are the ascospores that are windborne. We know that if we go so later and later and later, we will avoid less or we'll avoid less of them. But again, look, if we sow late, <laughs> we run the risk of not sowing at all. Um, and I, I'd imagine it's pretty much exactly the same with yourselves. And um, what has happened, and that has happened over here this year, where look, the, from, I suppose, late September through till November, maybe even mid-November, it was just a washout. So there's a lot of wheat that probably hasn't gone in, and a lot of barley hasn't gone in where it should be in. Um, and that won't go in now, being honest. Um, it's, it's, it's done. Uh, and any hope that anybody had of going in, in January is pretty much washed out of it and um, being honest. So it is a case that actually, look, we we can say delay is uh, delay your sowing, but there has to be a caveat in that to say delay is delay your sowing as much as you feasibly can. And that comes down to you guys knowing, knowing the fields, knowing your farm, knowing what's actually really possible there and um, being honest. OK. And then the other aspect, of course, will be that resistant variety. Um, and we know from, from our own trials now, these trials are a few years old. Uh, they were conducted by a postdoc that we had, Joe Lynch, where he took a, a range of varieties and, and we took a, a fungicide program, two spray program. Um, it was a, either an Azol or an Azol SDHI. And he did the dose response curve on them. And he had, he had, I suppose, three different types of varieties of what we'll call here SR5, which is a, a typical rating of five, SR7, which is a rating of seven, and SR8, which was very good at the time. This was actually Stig. Um, all you could see is that with, when, when the ASOL SDHI worked, we could see that actually it was for the SR5 and SR7, so those varieties that have a resistance rate of five, resistance rating of seven, most of the scenarios that we saw, it was actually worth our while putting on maybe 8.8 of a, of, of a dose or maybe even closer to a full dose at each time of the STHI is on. With the stig, of course, it, it wasn't. Um, the case would be we could see that actually, look, the, the point of inflection there, where actually it was costing, I suppose, or we were losing money, um, was a lot lower. So what we were sort of saying this was we really need very resistant varieties to actually reliably be able to reduce our fungicide input. Um, now, there are going to, there's going to be years where actually even that stig basically required an input, and that was due to rust, other than it wasn't necessarily uh, septoria. It was going to be, it was brown rust came into stig. Um, but also, we know stig had other issues that probably meant that it didn't really take the market. And I suppose the biggest issue was that it came commercially in 2012, which just got absolutely hammered with fusarium and killed it stone dead. Um, but then we can look at varietal. I suppose ratings over the last number of years, and you think that, look, we know we need resistant varieties. We should be growing resistant varieties, but we look at what we do grow, uh, and I, I should I, I should say this this data does need to be updated, but it's up to 2017. But it hasn't really changed that much since, being honest. In terms of the proportion of the crop that is a resistant variety, or or even up into that higher level of resistance, is relatively small over the last 20 years, and. Um, now, it isn't that those varieties aren't aren't available. There there are some available, but they're they're few and far between. Um, so we can look at it and say, okay, why what's happening? Um, being honest, why are we not growing those? And we can look at our recommended list. Uh, and in comparison to yours, it's it's only a fraction of it. This is what we grow. Um, being honest, and I'll, I'll put a bar on it. This is really what we grow, and <laughs> it is green. Um, it's probably accounting for about 70% of, of the wheat that is growing in Ireland at the moment. And if we go back that, if we go back a previous slide, um, we're talking in 2014 for a lot of the years there, we're talking about JB Diego. Um, not, not a very resistant variety in any shape or form for anything. But again, it was this sort of comment that consistency is king. Farmers knew what they were going to get. Um, and they, could, they would be sort of happy to say, look, we know we're going to get a good yield. It's going to be a good quality. It's going to be fairly consistent. And that is... That is what's what's really important. And OK, what's what's the problem with consistency? And I think when we talk about varieties and why we we don't have very high resistant varieties, I suppose partly because we don't have a breeding program specifically for Ireland. So we're reliant on, I suppose, breeders uh, putting tr varieties into trial in Ireland. Um, but also some of the varieties that might be available with, for yourselves, for example, um, Look, sprouting will be an issue, which will 
Killer Variety Stone Dead. Lodging will be an issue again. If you're bad lodging variety, it will not not work. And equally, Fusarium will not. Uh, no one will take up a variety that way. And I, I think up until now, anyhow, Septoria, although it is a, a really difficult problem that we have, it's probably not as difficult to control as this. Um, and it's most definitely not as difficult to control as something that's lying flat on the ground. And Fusarium is, we know that, look, even with the best of chemistry, we're t- probably talking about 60% efficacy. Um, and the reason being not because the molecules aren't ef- ef- efficacious, it's because we can we get our timing right? Can we get actually complete coverage for Fusarium? So that is, that's where I suppose we have our difficulty. And that's why we would have a, that aspect of, okay, we would we would take maybe a six or seven in terms of a resistance rating um, and work with that. And say, look, we will we will put the input in in terms of fungicides into that. Again, that's assuming that we have fungicides available. Um, if that becomes more difficult, then look, it will be a case of can we manage these? How how can we manage these? Being honest, going forward, you know, um, and it could be a difficult choice. And um, that's another aspect to sort of say because look, we can see barley, um, and especially winter barley in terms of consistency has increased over the last decade, maybe 15 years, and has eaten into the area of, of winter wheat in, in Ireland, specifically in the southwest. So I want to talk then basically, I suppose, in, um, in terms of building septoria control programs, if I take that look, as I say, our agronomy aspect, we want to we want to delay it as late as possible. Your farm, that's basically the start of October, and that's it, you're done. And um, your system means that you can't go any further. Your farm means it's, it's it's not one that you're going to take the risk because you need to get the crop in. We then need to look at actually what we're trying to do from a disease control program perspective. And I think I don't have to ask which crop you'd prefer. Um, I think the one on the right, of course, would be that. But what is it What is it about that um, crop on the right that we want? Um, and it's, it's pretty much a case of, that sunlight is being captured by those leaves, converting it into carbohydrates that are going into those grains. If we had the exact same crop on the left-hand side, there's less green leaf area in that upper canopy to do that. So of course it is going to have less carbohydrates in those grains. So there's the yield loss. And that's basically what Septoria does. So what we want to do is try and prevent that from happening. Um, And look, I take it that, as I say, we sow, I suppose, into October, First, second week of October, we have a mild winter. Crops emerge very well, and ascospores land in the crop. It's it's damp, it's mild over the winter months. We don't really get any frost, anything to slow down septoria. It'll come into early spring or late spring, I should say, as the crop is starting to extend, with plenty of inoculum at the base. Um, any any amount of it there that will actually cause enough septoria to uh, cause enough, or I, I suppose septoria to cause what you're seeing here in terms of those lesions. So, how do we then build a program, or what do we do to try and uh, build that program? Uh, and that's where I suppose we need to look at actually those leaf layers and what we're doing from a fungicide perspective. How are we protecting those leaf layers? Uh, and so, what we 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 started back a number of years ago, uh, before we lost chlorothalonil, we were looking at actually look, coat the leaf layers, coat them with chlorothalonil or chlorothalonil. I think we used the lattice here at the time to cover all disease rusts potentially might go in there. We had a complete matrix of trials where we started leaf four. We had one plot that would have a leaf four, a leaf three, a leaf two, and a leaf one. We'd have another plot that have a leaf four and a leaf two. Made up another one that have a leaf three and leaf one, and others that all combinations. Uh, and what we could see was that actually, look, it's no surprise, leaf four, when you have that type of program, it showed the lowest contribution. Um, and one thing that I'm sort of saying here is that, uh, and it's something that we, we try to actively talk about in, in in terms of the amongst advisors, amongst our specialists, et cetera, is that we're not talking about teas, we're talking about leaf layers. So our application will be at that leaf tree. And um, we can see that actually leaf tree has a, a similar contribution to the overall yield, so as we would say to leaf two or, or leaf one in terms of this type of trial, which from a physiological perspective doesn't necessarily make sense because we can go back to our, our, our picture beforehand and say, look, Leaf tree there, you're not even seeing leaf tree, um, it's dead. Um, and you can see here that, look, leaf tree is probably starting to die back here also um, as a crop is grain filling. So its contribution directly to, to grain fill is, is quite small, but is it contributing more to the epidemic or the imp- impact on the epidemic? 
Uh, and I suppose that's where that pre-stem extension T0 of UL or LEAF4 application would have been, I suppose, viewed that it, it, it delayed that epidemic. But I suppose we would think well, we work, I suppose, going back maybe maybe 15 years at this stage where we would have started going, OK, look, what are we putting on at that LEAF4 application? And could that impact or influence or adversely affect what we were actually using at the key time and switch our, our LEAF2 on, on our flag leaf? Because that's what a normal program is. It's timed, uh, or I should say a normal septoria program is timed to actually co uh, correspond where the leaf tree is fully emerged. Um, and at that stage, you're actually getting quite a good coat onto leaf two um, in a protected, probably protected manner, and presuming that it hasn't had a huge amount of rainfall on it. If not, it's going to be relatively curative. Um, and then you're coming back in with your flag leaf application, your, your leaf one application, where you're going with the flag leaf fully emerged um, and curing up any active, any sort of disease that would have come through within that week period or so. Um, or may, I suppose maybe by the time it came out, you're talking maybe a week, 10 days of that lower half of leaf two. Um, and you have to remember that we're talking about the main tiller. We're, look, we're going into a field, we're assessing it, we're looking at the leaf tree fully emerged. You're talking about the main the main tiller across the crop. Um, because this is a conversation that we have every year with our advisors and, and also with the farmers. When we talk about leaf tree, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about going into a field and you're looking for, it won't be uniform, the, will, the crop will never be uniform. There'll be a tiller here, there'll be a tiller there. The main tillers are what we're trying to look at. And trying to get leaf tree fully out amongst those or over those and that's where we'd be going with our first application as i say then we'd be coming back in with the flag leaf application and between the two trying to capture that that's leaf two there and um, the aspect about the leaf four when chlorothalonil was available we were happy to say look chlorothalonil if you're going out with a weed spray yeah no issues putting chlorothalonil in we wouldn't be putting for septoria we wouldn't be including anything else for it um, that, that discussion, once chlorothalonil was lost, um, it changed a bit because we looked in and said, OK, what would you put in at that stage? And is there a benefit from putting it in? I should say, look, we're clearly not talking about rust here. We're talking about septoria. Um, it rust, we know that actually that would that graph would be different if rust was the, the yellow rust was the major thing we were talking about. And we had a lot of yellow rust. That leaf four response would be quite large. But it is septoria. We're talking about varieties such as maybe even the Costello would have been one that would have been over the last number of years, moving into some of the newer varieties. And um, even if you're going into that seven rate, and you might question what the value of that would be there from a septoria perspective. But it, but as I say, when we move into uh, post CTL era, we're left with fulpit, and that's the discussion. Where do we use our fulpit? We clearly see where the yield responses from a septoria perspective in terms of a program are going to be. So that's where we should be using. That's where we feel we should be using our our, our full bit. Should be at that leaf tree and that and that flag leaf. And um, if there's anything else that you want to put in and spend a lot of money on, whether it'll always return it or not is going to be a question. Um, so that's I suppose that's where we think in terms of our timing. And um, I think I was going to I suppose get back to what do we use? Um, and I know Catra put up the curve, so I wasn't going to dwell on that. I won't dwell on that. I just say that actually look from. From your perspective, look, in terms of the resistance status, there are probably similar sensitivity between what we would have over here and what you guys would have. So it's probably similar in terms of um, what Catherine would have would have shown in terms of the efficacy and the curves. So that doesn't answer what you're necessarily going to use, but I suppose when you're looking at a fungicide program, it is going to be predominantly septoria, but there may well be an issue with that, or it might be an aspect of ice spot you might want to look at. There might be an aspect of maybe potentially yellow rust. So you need to choose your products based on, 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 I suppose, the strength, not just of one, but on the strength of the overall package and the risk that will be in those varieties or the risk that will be in your scenario or situation in, in, in the farm and the crop. But I, I want to tease back in terms of, again, that full bit sort of aspect, because it is a, a conversation that We've had over here over the last, I suppose, number of years, loss of CTL. Look, CTL definitely was important. And these are trials that we conducted and um, started in 2019. We took three varieties, Castello, x and JB Diego. I suppose we included x at the time when we started this work, thinking that, look, it's based on, uh, on the data that was coming from England, was that it's a very, very resistant variety. Probably not quite as resistant with us uh, as you guys, especially down here in Cork. And um, it's probably a six, I would I, I'd imagine from that. Costello's a four, JB Diego is a four. Um, but Diego, well, I had an issue with rust. Costello doesn't have the rust. 
the trials we put in at the time, as I said, were 2019 they started, so we didn't have the newer chemistry. So we were using a lattice era followed by Librex, 80% uh, rate of each. And then we had uh, the combinations of actually, look, the, the CTL at a litre in both applications. I should say this is a leaf tree and a flag leaf application. We had a full pit at 1.5. We can apply two applications of full pit, total of three litres. Um, we included Mycoseb at the time. Uh, we no longer have Mycoseb, but we also included sulphur. We had a, a, an enema, our formulation of sulphur was 10 litres per hectare. Now there's new formulations that are uh, much lower quantities, a lot more probably uh, user friendly, potentially, my way of putting it. But you, what you can see is that, look, the issues of resistance in the programmes, we can see that we're getting about 50%, just, uh, just so I suppose just over 50% or just under 50% control from that, that fungicide program. And I'm demonstrating that, look, in, in last year, clearly the azole issue and the SDHI issue of the older chemistry uh, clearly had an impact. So nobody would be relying on this anymore in, in terms of their, that type of program that you would be moved, move our most growers, I would I would say um, pretty much all growers have moved to either Fenpic Oxamide or, or Myfen Trifluconazole, Revisol or Inatrec or, or combination of actually both, being honest, I won at either time. Um, but we could see the benefit, look, clearly of chlorothalin, it, it worked. But you can see that actually, look, the full bit was providing significant disease control. And this then was followed through in terms of yield. Now, we would say that actually, look, there's a, there is a difference between the chlorothalin and the full bit. Um, but clearly, you can see what the full bit was bringing to the, the fungicide program that we were using. And we, we think, um, look, we know that actually using the newer chemistry will bring, bring you back up to where we were with, with the chlorothalin. But it is a case of actually, look, the full bit is providing disease control and it's probably providing some level of disease control, even in the, the control program where we are using uh, Revisol followed by Inatrec or, or the other way around, whatever way you want. Um, but we also know that, look, it's important from a resistance management perspective, and that is something that we, we do need to be be aware of. Um, and, and, and I suppose, yeah, just a, a very quick picture to, to, to show that, to clearly look at what we were seeing in terms of our disease assessments were coming through very, very clearly and full but clearly having some benefits in terms of our disease control, not just um, in, in terms of resistance management. So as I say, resistance management is an important thing and it is something that from a research perspective we do do and that's the monitoring aspect that I mentioned before and I will just have a couple of slides to I suppose overview what we do in that aspect. Um, so before Fenpic Oxamide came on the market, we, we collected samples from throughout Europe with, with our colleagues as part of a Euro-Res project. So these are BAs, Belgium, DK, Denmark, Germany, Ireland, and Sweden. And then we had a collection of, I suppose, isolates going back to 2006, 2007. And um, we tested them in the lab. So basically we take the leaves, we isolate them, we grow them up on the agar, and then we grow those, that fungus sort of Zemo septoria, the pathogen in the presence of increasing concentrations of the fungicide to generate what's called an EC50 value. It's basically a value that says how much of this pure active ingredient, and that's fenthagoxamide that we would be using, how much of that is required to reduce the growth of the, the, the fungus by 50%. What we can see is that differences existed throughout Europe even before the molecule was registered. Um, but not they're not massive differences, is what I would say, uh, in terms of that. Tease it out a little bit forward, or and we can see that actually these differences are not target site related, they're related to the ability of the pathogen to actually pump the, the molecule out of its cells. And we know that that's important because, look, from an efficacy point of view and in terms of Inatrec, anyway, we know that it works um, even against these strains that would be up there um, at the, the reduced levels. We know from glasshouse studies that they, they work quite, Inatrec works quite well against them, equally as well as, as I suppose, what we regard as the sensitive strains. From a research perspective and obviously a monitoring perspective, this is important for us to, to actually set that baseline. And um, we say baseline, it is before the molecule is emerged onto the market. So that if something does happen, um, and it is something that we, we know from uh, the green dots down here, which we are looking at in paraclostrobin, so the strob, basically the difference is here where we have a sensitive strains in the green compared to the black guys up here, which all contain the G143A or strob resistant, is huge. So we have this data set now for Fenpic Oxamide that if we do see something, we'd imagine that actually the differences that we're seeing here, we'd probably see the dots growing up here 
possibly even beyond what we have in the scope of it. So we're looking at this data thinking, OK, we know that there's not target site resistance there. We, we were able to look at the target site too and sequence or an an analyze the target site, but it allows us in time to keep monitoring the population uh, and make sure that things aren't necessarily changing. And if they are changing, how can we put the strategies in place to try and delay it um, from, from selecting? Um, because evolution look will potentially lead to eventually something emerging um, and we need to be able to try and monitor and protect that from becoming a problem. All right, someone asked a question there or no? I'm uh, just going to say, Steve, just conscious yep. of time. I don't know, we're we about sort of five minutes away about. Oh yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll run through. We are pretty much the exact same for, for my fin trifluconazole, exactly the same, large differences in sensitivity. We know that. We know the mutations, we know everything that is there. I'm not going to get into that, but we can see that it's both a combination of target site and non-target site. OK, uh, and then I, I suppose one, I'll fly through a few slides basically because I've spoken a lot about the fungicide monitoring, but we got a, we got taught a lesson in 2020 uh, and 2021 on actually the variety aspect is, is, is equally important, and that's the cougar issue. Started with a few small foci of infection in, in variety plots, and um, we were able to confirm it in the glass house that this was specific, that actually it was it was related to the cougar uh, in the background of astronomer and the background of Saki. And um, we were able to then look at it further into another other varieties and can see that, look, it wasn't just those two varieties. They were on the market, but there was a range of other varieties that were coming to the market um, and had the same problem. I should say that the plots that we saw this in originally were in fungicide treated plots, and that was a concern. Um, but we were, thankfully, even though it is a big enough concern that we were seeing these, thankfully that it wasn't related to fungicide resistance. It was varietal resistance. But in reality, when you put these varieties under huge pressure with a virulent strain, we were seeing a huge amount of disease control. And this is last year, or sorry, the year before 2021, before these varieties had reached farm. And um, these are plots. And to give an idea, well, this is what Graham was looking like in the in this in the in the trials, and everything else was pretty much a dismal. And um, and I suppose the guys in the Department of Agriculture who make the recommended list, once they got the plot yields actually in, um, it was easy. It was an easy decision for them not to recommend these varieties, because the relative yields had absolutely fallen off a cliff for them, um, and it was clearly related to to that actually cougar gene. And this is before the varieties actually were growing really on farm. Um, so it, it really sort of, it, I suppose, from a pathology point of view and pathologist point of view and researcher, it was it was very interesting. But from our aspect and being able to provide advice um, and being able to sort of give it, give advice for decisions on what you should be doing and sort of said, look, we do a lot of work on fungicide sensitivity monitoring. Maybe we should start doing some work on septoria in terms of varietal resistance. Um, and it's a case of actually, look, walking a lot of plots and um, walking varieties that are, I suppose, coming into recommended lists um, maybe not yet on farm. Have an idea, just I suppose, if we see something like this or if, if the, I suppose, the evaluators see something like this that clearly it stands out um, as a foci, then actually, look, we need to be looking at that. We need to be monitoring that taking it into the glass house, seeing is it virulence, is it an issue? And 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 basically given given some sort of in, information to the industry or given it to the um I suppose our, our agronomists on what actually to do. And in, in the case of Cougar, we're probably fortunate to a certain extent that we got it before the varieties had made it with their way onto farm. In 2021 they were projected to be about 20% of the seed. Um, which is a huge chunk they were going from they were basically they were going out commercially really for the first time we issued that on the 13th of july as you can say and straight away look thankfully there wasn't a huge amount went into the ground otherwise we could have been back at that first picture that we you saw at the start uh, it could have been a lot more of that and even with some very very good chemistry could have been a problem so that is something that look we need to go forward on we need to look a little bit further we need to work not just our with ourselves in the department but we also need to I suppose work with the, the breeding companies etc to, to see what's going to come through is there risks there can we I suppose mitigate those uh, so my final then slide is uh, in terms of what advice we give it is the careful selection of variety um, and that is that isn't just before you put the seed into the tank that is a decision that comes in late summer 
where we would be saying, you need to be in local variety trials. What's happening locally? And I think the case would be in that cougar aspect would have been locally in Cork in the southwest. I suppose a lot of the agronomists would have probably seen those in 2021 where actually they were absolutely decimated and the decision was easy. Even though we, we issued notice, the decision was very easy and um, the, the risk was too high. Um, but it is a case of actually making sure that they're in and seeing that. And that has to be, to a certain extent, it has to be some way local uh, for that to be made, that decision to be made. Look, the delay is, delay is on as late as possible. Yeah, as I say, look, there's a lot of pitfalls there and that actually comes down to very local decisions again. A lot of local decisions going on here. And again, then matching the risk, uh, matching the fungicide to the disease risk. And that's not just a fungicide, but it's also the rates of the doses that you will be putting on. Um, and that's probably that that decision isn't going to be made at this stage. That decision is going to be made as we move into spring, being honest. And that risk is going to come through, whether it's septoria, whether it's yellow rust, uh, any other disease that would be there. That has to be made on what's actually happening on the farm. And it's it has to be made by actually walking the crop, being honest, and knowing what's what's actually happening out there. Um, and overall, look, as I think uh, maybe Catherine said at the start, it's about the IPM is actually it's about monitoring. It's about assessing and making changes where appropriate. And that change can be within the season. But as I think Catherine mentioned about having that untreated plot at the very uh, start of a small area, turning on and off the sprayer, gives a very good idea of what's actually happening out there. Um, and actually testing maybe on, the, on your own farm, very simply, it is observational but it will actually help you inform the decision. And that is IPM, where actually the decision, you you make progress on what has actually happened beforehand. Um, and it's not just for septoria, it's for, I suppose, every aspect of growing a crop. Um, and of course, look, lots lots of people involved in, in, in the work that does go on. As I said, look, it's a collaborative effort. So I'm after spending an awful long time there talking, so <laughs> sorry about that. But hopefully, hopefully you will have got something uh, of use. No, that's a good, Steve. Thanks. There's, there's a lot of information, as you say, to soak in. Um, no doubt, be glad to look at the recording and choose some of it over again. But are, are there any sort of questions that are jumping out at, from people uh, that have been listening in there? Well, oh, I'm going to ask one question then. Um, and, and, I hope this isn't a negative question, but will we, will we be growing wheat in ten years' time? Can can we win this battle? And and, and if we, hoping hoping you got a positive answer, <laughs> where where do, where do you see the the emphasis coming from? Will it be genetics and breeding and varieties, or or will it be chemistry, or or is that that sort of rounded IPM approach still what's going to be the critical critical? I I, I think it's program. going to. Be- yeah, I, it's it's a it's a very interesting question, uh, Philip. I think the answer is, of course, we will be growing wheat if the market. Well, I should say, if the market wants wheat, wheat will be growing. <laughs> Full stop. That's a, that's a simple way of putting it. Can we grow it? Is going to be the other question. And I think, look, it is a case of taking the balance of chemistry and putting it onto the other components. I think there has to be an equal sort of spread of risk. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about a risk management um, and that risk management has to be equally spread because once you put too much of it into one, undoubtedly that will actually fall through at some stage. Um, so chemistry will bring us definitely. Uh, I know Catherine sort of said, look, there are, are you asked that Catherine the question about what's in the in the in the in the trials? Yeah, there's interest in molecules there. They they do look good, of course. Um, but they're not going to be the sole solution. There's interest in varieties definitely coming down the line. There's interest in varieties available for you guys already. Um, but again, they are at a risk aspect there, be it septory, be it yellow rust. And of course, the agronomy itself, systems will be changing there. Um, and the risk, of course, of something like a delayed sowing is that you don't sow at all. So it's about spreading all that risk. Yeah, thanks. Catherine, do you want to add anything to that? Or? No, I don't think so, Stephen, covered everything. Yeah, good. Um, Arthur. Um, I was wondering, um, we've heard good reports of a Depodin, uh, but then we keep hearing rumours that it's not going to get approved next year. Do you know um, we had it in trials in Ireland? Oh, no, I, 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 I think it wouldn't be any secret to say that we have had it in trials in Ireland, of course. Um, and it wouldn't be any secret to say that actually, look, it's under review. Um, whether whether you guys would have it before us, 
think that's probably looking away. Whether anybody has it, I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be the thing. All right. we, we would hope, look, it is. But again, it gets back to the question, look, it, it is only part of the solution, I think, being honest. And I think we, we really do have to look at the varieties that we're growing and how we're growing them and, and spreading the risk. OK, it's another mode of action. It just helps. And it's good on other diseases, which is looks very good to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, the more modes of action that we have and the more diverse modes of action we have, the absolute better. Like uh, in reality, what we currently have, we have we have three, three modes of action, three big modes of in the, our single side action. And then we have fulbit, which, of course, may itself be under pressure eventually, um, as all molecules really are. Um, but if we can if we can get more uh, modes of action that are effective, we can diversify and reduce the risk of, of, I suppose, resistance development for those. So the more we have, the better, the more varieties with diversity we have, the better. Um, and the more windows of planting and agronomy aspects, the better. But again, they're all coming at some level of risk. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Mike. Yeah, thank, thanks, Philip, and um, thanks, thanks, Stephen, for a fascinating um, overview there. A uh, question I wanted to ask you, Stephen, we, we've looked a lot at um, um, the dose rate curves tonight, and I, I take on board the comments that you've made about Fulpit as well. Um, what sort of work do Chuggis do in terms of actual margin over input costs, sort of trying to sort of tease apart the best economic uh, program that a grower can put together taking into account those 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 response curves to to actually make a profit and keep us in the game yeah so in terms of the margin look we would be looking at we would be looking at yield and i'll be honest in terms of when i would be giving advice standing on the stage i will be talking about i suppose the bigger modes of action i won't necessarily be getting down into specific actives um, and the reason being that, look, there'll be it's a difficult market um, and all that can have an influence. We we know that, look, the yield response um, is clearly going to, out, I, I suppose, respond in terms of if we have a, a fungicide program, we, we can give a, an estimate in terms of the cost. We can clearly see that the response is is, is going to be maybe twofold on that in, in most years from a sectorial perspective. Um, the individual components then of a the individual actives, again, this is going to come down to that local sort of decision. It comes down to actually the varietal risk because, look, i give an example. For, for some reason that I'm not 100% sure, I've been honest, Bennington would have been a variety of choice for some growers over in Ireland from about maybe 17 through to 2021. Um, and we know the risk of yellow rust is massive in that and the spend that was required to control yellow rust in that was massive. Um, so, saying the margin over cost, we could actually say, look, yeah, that's you're, you're reducing your margins there when you put in Bennington. Again, that was local decisions um, for doing that and management of that. So it's very difficult for me to actually say exactly and sort of stand up and sort of say from that aspect of it. We can give the broad overview of it, definitely, and say that, look, in a, in a typical fungicide program and our typical spend, that definitely, yeah, the margins will definitely be there. I, I guess my it's, it's a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a, a wishy washy maybe answer to a certain extent, but um it's difficult to give a very clear one unless it's very local. Mike, that might give me an opportunity to, to give a, a bit of a plug for, for up and coming farm bench meetings because I guess that, that's a decision that could be looked at in the light of forward marketing prices and then working back on your budgeted input costs, which you know we 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 know a lot of the costs for 2023 harvest we could have sold some of that 2023 harvest and that were the sort of margins that are potentially available on an average yield except we can only use that at the moment but that will dictate how much margin profit you've got to play with to protect that end price but uh, that's for another meeting perhaps but um hugo Hi, good evening. Um, hi, Stephen. Um, I was just wondering, we spoke about um, variety blends earlier with Catherine. I was wondering what the uptake was in Ireland and um, any kind of barriers that growers feel like there is over there. Um, 
and yeah, any research. Yeah, um, I suppose from uptake, uptake is very, very low. There would be a small amount of growers, they're probably more in the regenerative type sort of scenarios. And um, being honest, I would be using those. Um, what are the barriers to it? It's a difficult one to know, um, being honest. I suppose the, the aspect would be that we have research, we are doing a small amount of research on it, but the research that would have been carried out probably maybe 10 years ago at this stage was looking at it from a yield stability perspective and was there a yield benefit? That's when I suppose fungicide programs were working uh, very well. That said, they're still working well, but maybe cost a bit more. Um, and there wasn't that, there wasn't a big benefit the, in 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 that in that data or that data didn't show really any benefit to actually the solar components were as good as. Um, in terms of our research specifically, look, we know there's an, a lot going on uh, elsewhere, not necessarily in Ireland. So we haven't we haven't delved hugely into it, but we are looking at it, probably taking it from a, an aspect of one of the things that Catherine sort of highlighted was about the protecting the varieties, for example, and, and we have we have trials in the ground that are a three way mix to look at that to see will it actually delay or slow down the development of, of, of variants or will it actually speed up the level of variance? So it is something that we are we are looking at and um, the data that we would have from last year's trials, so 2022 trials, it does show and I, sh I should say the mix that we would have had was Astronomer, it was Graham and it was Costello. They were what was available, being honest. The astronomer was giving us an aspect that we could see the development of variants. Um, and from a disease perspective, yes, we did see in, in two, two of the trials, two or three of the trials, in the untreated, there was definitely a benefit from a disease controlled perspective. There was less disease on the untreated than there was in the in the solo components. As soon as we added fungicide, then we lost that. And that was as low as a quarter rate fungicide. We lost that benefit. Um, and I suppose that's the aspect of it from from a, 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 the aspect of can we utilize this to reduce our fungicide input? It may not be possible. Will it provide us with resilience so that actually if something does break, that it won't go completely bang? That may be looking at it, but that's a lot more difficult to actually measure uh, because we have to wait for something to go bang for that to happen. So we might be, we're trying to look at it maybe from that cougar sort of gene aspect to sort of say, look, if it does go, if we, if we do get a high proportion in the population, will it be better in the mix than not? Um, but the flip could be the the opposite way that it could actually bring the the, the bad genes together too in the mix. So it's it's very much one that we are, we are looking at. Um, as I say, the barriers are the biggest barrier probably is getting seed. To be honest, um, that's probably the biggest barrier. I think um, I don't know whether Rob Beaumont's on still on the call or not, but uh, the, the, a gang of them tried some blends in in Hereford last last harvest and we were talking about it last summer and I think from from memory it feels like a long time ago now but the, the sort of overriding message was it, it wasn't the silver bullet but what it did do was give a bit more time and a bit more flexibility um, to, to, to control programs so it sort of took, took the pressure off a bit in that sense. Yeah and I, th I think from a research perspective that's a very difficult one to quantify. <laughs> so yeah. to be able to stand up and say it's, it's doing that very clearly, it will be difficult to do. But it's something that look, again, that is the sort of scenario where I put up the, the different how we approach our research. It, that's coming from outside. That's coming from in to sort of say we those questions are being posed of us, so we have to address them. Yeah. Catherine, are you close to any of that work going on with, with Hereford Boys or? No, I hadn't heard no. about it actually. It'd no, be good okay. to. Hi, okay. hi, Philip. Um, yeah, sorry. Hi, it's Rob. Um, yeah, just interjecting on the blend stuff. Um, yeah, we got on quite well with it um, this year. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Jack, he has got some yield data from his combine, which I'm hoping he's going to be able to share with us. Um, and I did visual assessments of my crops throughout the year. Um, and we've got on pretty well with our um, blended varieties and I've taken a different agronomic approach to things as well so for this year we've used one fungicide at T2 and the rest uh, we've done through nutrition management and biologicals um, and yeah just trying to take different approaches to it really um, when you look at what we've discussed this evening and you look at the actives that are available and effectively with you know we've got Revistar and Univoc 
as the only really effective actives for septoria control. If we lose those and we don't get replacement chemistry, we are going to have to work out how we grow these crops um, with less fungicide. It's inevitable, so we've got to start doing the work. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, well, well, Rob, were there any practicalities to growing the blends in terms of just, as I say, the sheer mechanics of it, or is it, is it fairly straightforward? No, no, it's pretty straightforward. What we did discover um, is that actually the sort of X stays, as it were, within the blend uh, tended to lead the way. Um, and the other the other varieties tend to sort of catch up with it. So by the end of it, the growth stages uh, were, were fairly even. So from terms of a management point of view, um, certainly by the time we got to flag leaf, everything was coming up at the same time and maturity all ended up even anyway, whether that was due to the dry year we had just causing everything to senesce anyway. Um, I don't know, but I certainly didn't have any um, any sort of logistical or management challenges with it being a blend over the straight varieties on the farm. Thanks, Rob. That's useful to hear. OK, we're sort of pre pressing on towards nine. We've had a, a good we've had a good dose. I'm not I'm not seeing any um, yellow flashing hands at the moment. Um, so I'll just start to wind up. But if anybody thinks of a question as we finish, it's not too late to to, to do that. I uh, just want to close by really saying thank you very much to, to Catherine and, and Stephen. Uh, it's, it's been a great opportunity to have you over here. Um, online so to speak Stephen that we wouldn't have normally had and and to get your experience and and Catherine uh the, the work you're doing uh with, with HDB so but again I guess it's, it's that message uh, that both of you have portrayed it's 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 not one size fits all and it's that integrated approach that's going to going to lead the way and and perhaps as Rob's sort of highlighted perhaps even more radical thinking required going going beyond that um Thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, it's been a bit of an experiment. Uh, I hope uh, it's, it's not quite the same as a room. We all know that, but I hope uh, certainly we've had a, a greater number on the call than we perhaps would have had if we uh, just pulled a physical meeting together at, at Saltash. Um, so that that's been interesting, and we'll we'll see what the uptake is on the recording. But thank you very much. But we'll look forward to being back um, with a vengeance on the on the 16th of of um, February. Uh, down at the Weary Friday at uh, Peloton, and we'll we'll have a good session on on the, on the pounds and pennies and margins of uh, profitability of different rotations. So with that, if nobody's thought of any last minute questions, uh, we'll all, we'll all sign off and and go away and have a cup of tea or a tot of whiskey or whatever your fancy is at this time of night. Uh, and um, thank you for joining us, and and see you again soon. Thanks everybody, much appreciated.